Greetings and welcome to CCIM Institute's webinar, Long May You Run, an Essential Commercial Real Estate Tune-Up, featuring the Institute's Chief Economist, Casey Conway, Mark Seipert, CCIM, and Andy Edmond, CCIM. Andy graciously stepped in for Brian Everett, who's unable to join us. We appreciate Andy's willingness to lend her time and expertise to this important conversation. In addition to being CCIM's Chief Economist, Casey is the Director of Research and Corporate Engagement at the Alabama Center for Real Estate, also known as ACRE, housed within the University of Alabama's Culver House College of Commerce. Conway is a frequent speaker for the Federal Reserve, FDIC, SHLB, state bank commissioners, academic groups, professional organizations, and industry associations. He previously served as Chief Economist for Colliers International U.S. Mark is a partner with Middleton Partners, a private equity investment firm specializing in creating value in quality properties through acquiring, developing, leasing, managing, and re repositioning quality properties in targeted markets. During his career, he has participated in 16.9 million square feet of office, industrial and retail acquisition, and development ventures with a total market capitalization of $2.25 billion. Mark is an award-winning senior instructor for the CCIM Institute with a specialty focus on commercial property market analysis, which he teaches globally. Andy is the managing partner and principal broker for NAI Cascade Commercial Real Estate, one of the largest commercial real estate companies in Central Oregon and part of the NAI Global Network of Companies. A champion of transparent deal development and open source technologies in commercial real estate, Andy provides comprehensive advisory services for commercial real estate investment firms and high net worth investors as their single point of contact. Last month, CCIM released the first Commercial Real Estate Insights Report of 2019, which details many new resources for today's industry professional. Today's conversation will explore key topics from that report, including economic metrics and data, co-working, the impact of e-commerce and opportunity zones. But the report includes many resources that we won't have time to cover here today. To access the full report, please visit ccim.com forward slash insight. During today's webinar, you will have the opportunity to ask questions by using the Q&A feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen. To ensure enough time is allotted to cover today's content, the panelists panelists will respond to questions at the end of the presentation. A recording of today's presentation will be made available to attendees within the next 24 to 48 hours. Casey, please continue with today's presentation. Great. Thank, uh, thank you, Jennifer. And uh, do a quick sound check. You can hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay, great. So thank you for the uh, kind introduction. I want to thank uh, the CCIM um, communications team, you, Jennifer, and Angela and Larry for helping pull all this together. And uh, these, thank the leadership of the CCIM for these uh, insight papers and opportunities. They, they heard from the members about wanting some uh, more frequent and relevant kind of content. And so this is a delivery on that promise. And the communications team has made it real easy for uh, for Mark and, and Andy and I to join today. So we're going to start quickly with the economics stuff um, because at the heart of it all, uh, it it's kind of starts with the economics. I use a, an acronym right now. I've been, uh, you can tell where I'm at in my station in life. My kids are eight to 23. My, my youngest special needs son, we've been working on teaching him the difference between vowels and consonants. So um, my A, E, I, O, and U application of the economics here today for CCM's takeaway on this first part is analysis without economic intelligence, obfuscates understanding of CRE investing. So how, how's that one for using all my vowels? So we're gonna start with a few. We cover a, a number of them in the paper, but we start off looking at some important ones like the employment metrics, um, and then the uh, some of the small business and, and retail ones. So as many of you know, they've heard me speak. I'm not a huge fan of the, of the government BLS data. I joke that BLS uh, minus L equals BS because it's, um, not not uh, not updated and not that granular. It's based on a household survey of people with landlines at home in the afternoon. So I've never been called, never met anybody in 35 years. So I've been using things like ADP. Uh, ADP is the largest processor of payrolls in the country. So that's pretty valuable intelligence to tell us what's going on in actual payrolls. 
And the other one that we use and that I like a lot is the LinkedIn workforce report, which really commenced about two years ago. And if you're, if you're worried about what Facebook is doing with your private information, you might want to worry about LinkedIn as well. Uh, I joke that they know you're going to change jobs before you know they're changing jobs. But what they do is, is a pretty uh, neat, and you can see the slide here, um, on the LinkedIn workforce. But uh, they capture the, what's going on between the 190 million of us that have LinkedIn um, uh, uh, access and, and accounts. And they divide us all up into about 50,000 industry segments. So from pipe welders and contractors and accountants to uh, brokers and uh, finance and banking people and doctors and whatnot. And what they find is we're churning about 3 million jobs a month. And they look at where those are going, where they're being created. And they create what's called a workforce skills gap analysis. Um, and you can easily access the major MSAs with your, if you don't have the um, expensive account, um, which you can you can buy more detail, and they let you let you have insight as to which uh, communities and MSAs are have the most demand for certain skills and, and are lacking them. And if uh, poor poor Amazon had been following this when they were doing their their search for headquarters, they they never would have probably picked New York because believe it or not, they rank New York as the market with um, the worst skills gap analysis, meaning there was no available skilled workforce. They all had great jobs. <laughs> and uh, so unless you were going to poach them, it might not be there. So this is another tool that we'd like to, you know, kind of get you thinking about because as we move forward uh, in the complications, you know, with site selection and everything else, more of this granular type data is going to be important. I'll give you one more linkage out of the, uh, the employment metrics. So uh, we got the March jobs numbers, uh, which were, were, were very nice. Um, and, uh, it, and what we were are asking ourselves is, you know, kind of where are all these jobs and a few things that came out of it. And one of them that came out of it was more retail job cuts. Another 6,000 store closings announced. All we're doing is cutting retail jobs. Well, that's not so much the case. The way the BLS classifies jobs, the new retail jobs, which are in logistics and e-commerce, they get coded into things like wholesale trade and, um, uh, in professional business services and technology jobs. So we're not really capturing those. So that's one of the reasons I think that we need to evolve beyond BLS. Look at ADP. ADP tells us, you know, the stratification between small, medium, and large businesses. 60% of all the jobs being produced today are by companies with less than 500 employees. And the LinkedIn gives us more granularity on, on the um, on the skill gap. So if we advance the next slide, we'll look at the NF, one of my favorite ones, the NFIB information. And so the NFIB is one of my favorite ones. The National Federation of Independent Businesses for about 45 years has been tracking what's what's been happening in the optimism in small businesses. And uh, last year, uh, at least four times, they set records peaking in August at an all-time high of 108.8 in August. And what small business was telling us is, you know, they were finally really happy. They got regulatory relief, they got tax relief, they were ready to go, hire people, expand locations and whatnot. So tracking what's going on with small business in the NFIB index tells us a lot about the temperament of small business. Small business is about 70% of the US economy. They produce about 60% of the new jobs that we hear reported each month. So if you're doing site selection or you're doing analysis on a property and you don't have an understanding of what's happening in small business, you're, you're really missing out on a key, com a com key component of where they're going. We've seen this pull back a little bit in the first quarter to 101, but I think after the recent uh, GDP numbers, the consumer spending numbers yesterday, um, that um, that Mark, you may talk to us about, uh, we'll see that maybe there, I think this will bounce back up, but it's an important one to look at. And then if we can advance to the next slide and looking at the, um, on the retail side, the Dun Hunby information on retail and looking at where uh, grocery stores and retail properties, these actually look, they use things like the QSR codes and barcodes and actually work on uh, capturing that data to look at what grocer or what retail chain or whatnot is outperforming another. So when you're looking at market share, the, you know, we all know the dominant one or two uh, usually can command a better, a better price, a better financing terms than the three, four or five slots. So this is one that many of you had maybe had not been exposed to, but it's a unique one that I look at, when, especially when I'm looking at grocery. And I think it's an important one to look at because as we see, 
e-commerce mm -hmm. evolved from the Amazon world of stuff sold in the mall to now online grocery, this may become very relevant. So with that, maybe Mark, I open it up to you and ask your thoughts on some of the things as a, you know, an instructor and an investor that you that you look at. So give us some of your thoughts on the importance of economics and what's what are some of the things that you look at. Sure thing. Thanks, Casey. Um, I've got a um, uh, list of additional resources that I follow, uh, both in my business and in our CCIM instruction coursework. And I've listed a few of them here along with the uh, URL uh, addresses so the attendees can check these out on their own. So just a handful of these, the Conference Board of Leading Economic Index, they do a really good job of publishing a series of 10 economic indicators that they compile over time into the LEI. And it's a good metric. It's, it's shown great predictability on changes in the economy. I use that one. If I had to pick one, uh, that I use uh, that I think is the most reliable is the Consumer Confidence Index that's published each month by the University of Michigan. Uh, as we know, uh, job growth is a effectively a lagging indicator. There's a lot that goes on above that. The U.S. economy is about uh, two-thirds consumer spending, and if consumer confidence is high, that's a good roadmap, in my opinion, for the future of our economy. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia publishes a quarterly a map of state le leading indices by state. So if you're uh, focused on different geographies, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Philly is a, a good source that I like to use. Uh, probably my most favorite Federal Reserve website is the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, other known, otherwise known as FRED, Federal Reserve Economic Data. Uh, and it's a great uh, uh, resource that I use for a number of economic indicators, and I've listed those here on the slide. And then finally, uh, pay attention to what's happening with the Federal Reserve Board. As you know, they set economic policy. They're actually meeting uh, today and tomorrow, and uh, they uh, you know, determine the cost of capital and the amount of capital, which uh, does change uh, uh, signal changes in our economy. So, um, those are just a handful that I use, Casey. Well, those are, those are well great. Ones yeah, no, those are um, th those are great. Um, sorry about that. I quieted my volume a little bit. But one second. So, Andy, why don't why don't you give us a little a little thought on? Um, on, on some uh, one in particular that you use, which is the um, some of the construction cost stuff and things like Association of General Contractors or others, can, you can give us some thoughts on the construction costs and what are happening out there in, in, in your insights. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I think one of the um, premise on, on looking at any of these um, statistics or uh, informational resources is that as brokers, we really need to think about getting on the other side of, oh, I didn't see that coming. We see this, you know, uh, really rapid evolution of technology that's coming into our industry on a lot of different levels. And so what we need to be thinking about is, you know, where are we going? And when somebody comes up with an idea or a problem and you start to brainstorm, like, how is that going to work to not, to not stymie that by saying, well, it's just, it hasn't been done that way or it won't work that way. And so utilizing some of these resources, like the one you see in front of you is from the Association of General Contractors, which has just an extensive amount of information about the rise in construction costs, which as brokers, we need to be aware of so that we can help guide our um, clients to make decisions that are um, relevant and appropriate given what's going on forward looking to the market. And so this is one of those um, examples where you can get an understanding for what's happening with these construction costs. Um, it seems to be just sort of become a normal story right now where I have clients that are building multiple buildings, but over the course of time, and they are building identical buildings, but a year later, it's 20% more in construction costs. And a year later, the next one is another 20% more. 
So being aware of that and then being able to identify the impact that that's going to have on lease rates and some of the other things that our clients look to us for are the things that are going to distinguish us as valuable resources to our clients. And if we're not constantly thinking about what value we bring to our clients, we're not going to have a job in the long run. Um, so this particular one, uh, the other one that I really like is the National Center for the Middle Market, which Casey discusses in his uh, quarterly report. But uh, there's just terrific information in here. It's housed at the, uh, the Ohio State University. And um, it has all sorts of information for real estate professionals, economic development leaders, uh, and really lets us know um, what is happening in the middle markets and where that can be applied to our specific market, whether that market is a very small market like the one I live in versus the large MSAs that I do some business in. Um, so having that sort of big picture look um, on these different resources, again, to bring value is uh, very important and something that we want to um, continue to, to look for those opportunities and those resources. That's, that's great. So, you know, just to recap a couple of them, you know, there, um, you've got both the Association of General Contractors and um, things like ENR, Engineering News Record. It's really important right now because we're, we're affected by um, what we're seeing, you know, 10 to 10 to 20 percent increases um, in, uh, in construction costs here right now. So, uh, great on that. So why don't we why don't we advance along and talk a little bit about the co-working uh, side of things here? So co-working we threw in here is an is a good example um, because if you think about traditional office environments today, they're they're changing. The cash flow is changing. The occupancy is changing. A company like WeWork now is the largest office tenant in London, New York, and Atlanta. And if you if you really think about what's happening in co-working, we're we're hoteling essentially office space and so with that comes a whole set of um you know a whole set of challenges new different types of cash flows you know one of the questions we asked is is there a threshold point at mm -hmm. which um on the office side uh, co-working as a percentage of the building's occupancy becomes either accretive or a detriment and so trap uh, some of you may do that tracks all the securitization information out there started doing some work around it their latest numbers in a paper they presented at ARES, A-R-E-S, uh, American Real Estate Society out in Arizona, was that when you get to about 40% of a building's occupancy and co-working, their assertion is that it begins to have a negative impact on the value of the building. You have more demand on, it, on, on services, utilities, and the operating expenses go up. Um, and, and so you've got to deal with all of those issues and you're, and you're dealing with the different rent structures. So why don't we jump in a little bit, Mark, you've had a lot of experience on this and talk to us a little bit about office space and what you see happening and some of the challenges and issues there and things like around parking and all, all that goes with that. Sure. You know, uh, I recently uh, read a study published by JLL that focused on knowledge workers and what they found is that knowledge workers are at their desk only about 40% of the time, and that about 80% of their work is collaborative. So as a result, you're, we're seeing a big shift in office space design and utilization. I, I would call it a shift from the me space, the private office, to the we space, the collaborative office. And while that JLL study found that the average amount of space per worker as a result is continuing to decline, what I found most interesting is that 88% of office workers are in shared workspaces versus 12% now in private offices. That's definitely been a shift over my career. Um, but, you know, the, the average space per worker, while it's going down, has, um, it, it really depends on the type of in the industry sector. For example, financial services, that ratio is a, today is about 183 square feet per worker, but it's still pretty high for professional services. Uh, uh, over 400 square feet per worker. So uh, I think we really have to disaggregate what type of office and what type of office using sector we're talking about. But we're definitely seeing more and more a shift that I don't see changing uh, direction on more collaborative workspace utilization and design. 
Great. So, uh, Andy, any thoughts on that side? Or, you know, we're seeing the co-working move into industrial. Um, we've actually had it for a long time called 3PLs, but uh, co-warehousing, any thoughts you have on the whole co-working concept and thoughts or things you might want to uh, highlight? The, um, I think the co-working space is um, really interesting. And, you know, um, there's firms like CBRE that are, uh, even leading the edge on on brokerages, you know, we've been sort of used to house being housed in our own little uh, office spaces. Um, once you earn that uh, privilege, in a lot of cases, in sort of the traditional model, and seeing uh, firms like uh, a large firm like CBRE coming out and changing that up a little bit, and sort of trying to set a new standard and. Uh, maybe even creating some collaboration in an industry that is not known for its collaboration, um, I think is a really uh, interesting uh, direction that we're heading. I think the other piece that this leads into a bit is the, um, the parking changes that are going to occur not only on the office side in terms of having that density within the offices uh, but also on the industrial side, as we're starting to see uh, the types of industrial uses shift, where we have fulfillment centers, where suddenly we have a very high number of employees per square foot from an industrial perspective, and that impact on parking um, and the impact that that then has on the site area necessary for industrial properties that we um, have historically been able to put a lot of building on a small amount of dirt. And now we've got more parking issues. We have um, trailers, uh, tractor trailers that are doubled, and so they need more turnaround space. Those are all things that are um, going to have interesting impact on the development um, as as we go forward, and how that impacts um, you know that those spaces based on the density of employment. Yeah. So, and I want to bounce back to you, Mark, on this, but Andy, um, real quick on there. So, you think it's time for us to maybe rethink what are our traditional land to building ratios in uh, industrial, as we see both trucks needing um, bigger courtyards as they're pulling two trailers rather than one because of maybe the electronic log delivery challenge. And then, like you said, the employees, um, you think it's time to rethink that? Are we getting to that point or um, your thoughts on kind of the land to building ratios? I know I, I serve on a board of directors for a public REIT and we're one of the landlords for FedEx. And it seems like each one of their new sites and buildings, the sites get larger and larger. They want more land for exactly this capacity, whether it's trailer uh, parking, pad parking, or employee parking. But your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah. Oh, Go ahead, Andy. <laughs> I, I think we need to be thinking about it. Um, but then the other piece that we have sort of lingering in the background is the new autonomous uh, vehicles that, and we're seeing it in the trucking industry. Um, and what kind of impact is, is that going to have? And are we going to get to a point where um, not only with, with autonomous vehicles, but also, you know, ride share and are people going to be um, utilizing Uber, Lyft, et cetera, or having the driverless vehicles that are going to just simply drop people off to where they need to go. And then they're going to go to some sort of, you know, off site location waiting for the next time their owner needs the car and then come in. So, so I think it, it's, it's a cautious step that we have to make because again, that forward looking requirement to, you know, where are we going? And we know that, that there is a reality to, it goes back to my initial comment of, you know, who would have thought that we would have this, you know, be so close to these driverless vehicles and yet we are. So to just say, well, um, yeah, it's nice that, you know, my Tesla can drive down the freeway as long as it has two white lines to stay within, but are we really going to get to that point where I can take a nap in the back seat? You know, I think we have to give that real consideration and we're even seeing um, developers that are putting in parking structures that are, a, have a, the ability to be converted into some other use at a later time should the parking structures not be required. So people are thinking about it. We're going to get there. And I think that needs to be considered. 
Now, I know I know my uh, the principal at my son's school. She's hoping for autonomous school buses. They have such shortages of bus drivers, and that they won't hear any more complaints about the kids acting up. But um, Mark, uh, let's bounce back to it because Andy raised an interesting point. You know, we hear a lot about well, we're not going to need parking garages anymore. But in particularly the co-working cities with where co-working's been adapted, maybe you're you've seen something different. Uh, my experience has been that maybe the 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 demands for parking are actually going up in co-working, but your, your thoughts on parking? It, it, it's an interesting concept. Technology is definitely a game changer. I, I personally feel that, uh, you know, the standard parking ratio for your typical suburban office is more or less peaked. I, I do see a downward shift going forward for some of the same reasons Andy mentioned, even though we're using space much more densely. But uh, there's one interesting study uh, that I'm familiar with. Uh, my market is Dallas, and our DART is our public uh, transit provider. And they recently teamed up with Uber to provide free and discounted rides to people who live and work in areas with limited transportation. So uh, what they found is that most potential transit destinations are beyond walking distance from um, you know the, the ultimate uh, destination. And so ridership in uh, many major U.S. cities for public transit has fallen. And so as a result, uh, I think a lot of transit agencies are actually seeing DART and, uh, I'm sorry, seeing Uber and Lyft as a partner and not a competitor. And it, it also increases the ride sharing business as well. And where that's occurred, we're starting to see an increase in ride sharing and a decrease in the required amount of parking ratios. We'll see if this trend continues over time. But uh, we're seeing that in more and more cities now where we're making uh, you know, transit and transportation easier and less expensive for workers to get to their ultimate destination. So I, I, I would expect a maybe a peak in the demand for garages as we go forward. Yes, yeah, so I guess two, two takeaways here is maybe, maybe industrial is needing more because we've got employees that are uh, at the warehouses now doing fulfillment and we have more need for truck pad parking. And then on the office, we're gonna have to wait and see that, that play out between transit availability and lack of transit because uh, I don't think we're gonna get rid of all the parking garages, but um, I definitely think the parking ratio is one, you know, maybe the CCIM Institute we can lead on, uh, on rethinking where that goes. So that, that's a good discussion. Let's move on and talk a little bit about e-commerce and what's, what's happening there. We, um, uh, I was fortunate with my colleagues at the Alabama Center for Real Estate in Tuscaloosa, part of the University of Alabama. We published a pretty substantial paper um, uh, in February on logistics, uh, the transformative impact of, of uh, logistics infrastructure. And we looked at everything, not just you know ports and shipping and roads and bridges, but trucking and intermodal and rail and all of those things. And We've all heard the different ratios that you know e-commerce represents about a little over 10% of total retail sales. Uh, that understates really, I think, where we where we are. If you back out food and gasoline and whatnot, um, entities like MetLife have studied it and put that number in the high teens, approaching 20% uh, for the stuff that's not gasoline sales and grocery and restaurant sales. And we're seeing e-commerce grow at, at about a 25 to 30% per annum rate in the earnings releases from the fourth quarter that we got from the major retailers like Walmart, their online e-commerce was up over 40% in the fourth quarter of last year. So we know this isn't going away. Um, believe it or not, it's more expensive than traditional retail where we go buy and pick the stuff up at the store. Uh, so we cover that in this paper. And we think really the issue to focus on now is not so much e-commerce as a percent of, of sales and its growth rate, but how it's gonna change from really point of sale purchase to point of procurement. So it's really gonna become um, more, uh, more opaque in terms of you know, how we buy it, whether we do it online or whether we go to the store or some other means, but where's the point of procurement? Is it gonna be the Amazon way where they deliver, deliver in a Mercedes blue van? Is it gonna be the Kroger way where they accumulate your on, online grocery order and have it at your neighborhood drugstore like uh, Walgreens? Or is it going to be something else? And I think this point of procurement is telling us that retail's not dead, um, that we're going back to retail. Amazon had opened and then they closed, but they're still kind of opening stores. Um, so I think to think in e-commerce more about the point of procurement 
what's the point? Where is the point that you're going to get your online goods versus where you ordered it online or in person? And so this paper that we did, the link is there. You can go to our website. We, we really think this is going to change things. And those states that think about infrastructure just in terms of roads and bridges are missing the point. And so our whole paper was if you look at where Amazon's locating fulfillment centers or where Walmart or Target or any of these major retailers, Home Depot are, they're locating near where they have the totality of their logistics infrastructure. And that means a link to the port. It means intermodal and class one rail connections. It means, uh, you know, a level mm -hmm. of interstate. Um, it means Wi-Fi and, you know, whether we have, you know, 3G, 4G or 5G. So uh, we, we think that's kind of where we're headed. We invite you to look at that paper. It was part of something we discussed about in this long May you run um, paper. So with that, that kind of sets up to bounce back to you, Andy, on, uh, well, I'll stop here and see, you know, Mark or Andy, if you want to weigh in on anything there about e-commerce and your thoughts, concerns, or unique things or perspectives you're seeing happening there. I think that the important uh, piece, at least again, and I'm, I'm come into this conversation really with the sort of the broker mentality and the brokerage side of things. Um, and uh, I think one of the most important things that we can do as we look at the impact of e-commerce is um, observing your market and uh, really understanding how things are working, you know, specifically where you are trying to conduct your business. And by doing that, um, you're going to have a better sense of, of maybe where you can, uh, again, capitalize on what the needs are and what your clients' needs are. And, and going back to that idea of providing value to your clients. So if you're in a small isolated market, somewhat like my home market is, that we know that uh, last mile delivery, as an example, um, gets a little bit challenging because we are sort of in the middle of, of nowhere. So trying to get those, you know, six hour delivery times and so forth really is going to require uh, several spots where we can create that last mile delivery in a very short period of time versus a large market where um, there's an ability to um, use various resources to get that distribution out uh, as it relates to the e-commerce. And so understanding your market, I think is important. Um, there's a lot of discussion about last mile delivery or distribution in terms of where those fulfillment centers are and, um, and then seeing those um, being developed in former big box stores or uh, large malls or that type of thing. So kind of going back to Casey's point about, you know, they're, they're all trying to kind of stay together in one area um, we're seeing a lot of those changes occur and um, repurposing buildings that um, really aren't able to hold up. I saw an interesting um, note about a new Nordstrom model that is um, looking at 3,000 square foot stores, which is a you know, very, very small store relative to what Nord Nordstrom normally does, but it's, um, it's a new model where you basically come in and kind of find things, size things, and then they either get delivered or they're you know, stored in the back. Or, um, so there's some of these interesting things that are going on that are gonna change the way our retail sector looks. Um, back specifically to industrial, um, the difference in warehousing I think is really fascinating for the industrial sector because we have these volume warehouses where we see not only going to 32, 36 foot clear so that things can be stacked. There's the discussion around, you know, should we be charging by uh, no longer by square foot, but by, uh, by cubic measurement. And so that there's an accounting for that height, but we're also seeing uh, multi-story um, warehousing occur and you know what does that look like because of the cost of land and needing to go even higher um, and then one of the things I think is real interesting is this cross dock facility where really they're not particularly focused on storing but really just moving the product and where are those going to be located and then what are the site requirements for something uh, along that line um, so I, I think that continuing to look at that and, and being aware of it. And I'll just say it one more time, going back to looking forward and where, where is this possibility? 
what is the possibility and how do we capitalize on that? Um, so I'll leave it at that. Okay, anything you wanna add, um, Mark? Yeah, I think we've covered it pretty well. I'll just add, you know, my, my view is from an investor standpoint and particularly in the retail space, I think retail brands that do a good job of combining both their their physical and their digital sales um, to keep the sales, uh, as you mentioned, Casey, under one umbrella have benefited the most. And uh, Andy mentioned Nordstrom. So, uh, you know, recently both Lehman Marcus and Mord Nordstrom have struggled to grow their same store sales, but their e-commerce business is now about 25% or more of their total revenue. So they, you know, they're making that shift. I think the ones from an investor standpoint that are gonna have the biggest struggle are the retailers that have below average profit margins and then a large fixed cost for the real estate. And if they're not capturing their fair share of e-commerce, I think um, uh, you know, that's a potential troubled sign. Um, and I'll leave it at that unless you wanted to add more, Casey. No, that's a great point, maybe in advance to, into our next slide, because I think your comment on margin is very important that this, this cost of e-commerce is tremendously expensive and we're starting to see some experimenting with a way to deal with it. So uh, right now, if you look at a modern e-commerce building that's built for, for fulfillment, you're looking at well over $100 a square foot construction and that's without all the conveyor systems. But it's, you know, you got higher clear ceiling height, you know, we've gone way past 30 foot, we're, now 36, 40 foot clear and higher. Uh, the concrete flooring, um, you've got to go to a technology known as um, a ductile crete so that your forklifts and the electronics in there, you don't get curling and problems in the, in the uh, expansion uh, joints and whatnot in the flooring. So these things are getting very expensive. So on this slide, you'll see uh, what's now known as a tent warehouse and the tent fabric covering it is not much, not too dissimilar to what uh, is in place at the Denver International Airport Terminal. Uh, these can be built to be, um, you know, 30, 35 foot or more clear. They're a steel frame. The roof doesn't weigh much. Uh, and the one thing, if you saw the inside of these, the one thing that's missing is columns. So for uh, people doing e-commerce and wanting the maximum flexibility for how they reconfigure conveyor systems and whatnot, it's very desirable. They're also can be dismantled and move. So something changes in your supply chain. But here's the real advantage. These things can be put up in three to six months uh, at a cost of about 35 bucks a square foot. So when you compare 100 to 125 bucks a square foot or more in a two-year delivery for a modern e-commerce warehouse versus one of these that could be put up in three to six months uh, at a cost of 35 bucks a square foot, you may want to venture a guess as to whose attention they caught for this. It's Amazon. And Amazon is actually uh, developing and building and completing uh, a couple of tent warehouses right now to, to test them and debug them. So I think your point, Mark, on you know the cost of e-commerce and you know how retailers are under a squeeze in terms of the cost of their products, everything about this e-commerce supply chain and the product manufacturing and delivery is is under pressure. And I think that will downstream to us in industrial real estate. So here's here's one to kind of get us thinking a little bit there. Um, so if we want to advance onto the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about um, about this in the PACE findings report. I don't know if Mark, you want to jump in here and, and kind of some, how you use this and some thoughts around this or Andy as well? Um, you know, the uh, for uh, the uh, investor analysis on you know, looking at markets that uh, are going to benefit the most from these changes. We, you know, I focus on markets that have the, the greatest competitive advantages on on creating employment and retaining employment. And um, you know, I think uh, you know as we as we pick our markets, as we pick our trade areas, our sub markets in which to do our business. We really need to be mindful of these changes in technology that we've been speaking about today and uh, which are going to be the winners and which are going to be the losers going forward. And so, you know, we, we use a variety of data sources to help us do that. We teach that in the 102 uh, market analysis class, which I primarily focus on. And, um, you know, it's, it's an overall process. You have to have understanding of what's going on in the big picture as well as your specific trade area 
and uh, you know where where most of us make our living. Uh, Casey or uh, Andy, I don't know if you want to add anything to that as well. Um, I think that you pretty well covered it. The the one thing that I would kind of throw into the mix at this point, uh, as long as we're talking about some of the you know different resources, um, one that I failed to mention earlier that. Uh, I just learned about recently, and I think it's really fascinating, is um, the rail time indicators that is uh, produced by the Association of American Railroads. And what's really fascinating from an industrial real estate perspective is that you can get weekly and monthly uh, rail traffic data, and um, it can tell you exactly what commodities and goods are moving where they're headed, how many, um, what the volume is. And it's uh, going back to Casey's point about not depending so much on government um, data. This is a, a really interesting um, piece that allows us to look at where the product is going and how much is going and how quickly it's going. And all of those things then relate back to um, what the needs are on an industrial basis, what the retailers are receiving versus what's just going to fulfillment centers. And um, it can be, I think, a little bit of a black hole on data that you, know, you can get lost in, but um, it's just another interesting resource that is, um, I don't think a lot of people are aware of, and I just wanted to mention that. I appreciate you bringing that up, Andy. So we we could be stranded on Gilligan's Island as long, and be happy as long as we had our real time indicators report. It's it's one of my favorite ones. And for those of you that hadn't looked at it, I really encourage you to follow up on Andy's comments. Uh, it's not an expensive resource. It's about 110 bucks a year to get the monthly reports, and they break out a lot of things. And what was interesting is you know we were hearing about all the the dire and doom and gloom about the tariffs and uh, you know the end of the year and the economy was just going to go in the toilet. In December and January, the weekly rail intermodal rail traffic numbers set all-time records in the 40-plus years that they've been tracking it. So a lot of something was moving on the railroads. They also will foretell you if you're looking at things like auto sales. Auto, you know, the cars are being purchased and moved by rail uh, to the different dealerships. So if we see the orders and and uh, traffic of um, new autos uh, falling off on on the rail is a precursor that maybe we've got some things coming and we're not seeing that. We're continuing to see 16 half million, 17 million cars being moved. And the one category I'd encourage you to look at is the category they break out called intermodal traffic. These are the shipping containers that move by truck and rail and, and, and it's basically you hand off one, one shipping container from one mode of transit to another. And the numbers are, are stellar. If you look at the most recent um, rail time indicators report, the headline is that total rail traffic is down. It went down in the, at the end of the first quarter, but the main reasons were, were twofold. One was weather. There was some huge weather disruptions. Um, as you all know, those that you know, live in parts where you have weather the rest of the year, so you're not in nice sunny California or Florida. The other was there was a huge disruption in Mexico with the labor agreements down there and then blocking the Kansas City Southern uh, tracks. The other one was petroleum and coal shipments were way down. We're moving more petroleum by pipeline now than we are by rail car. So total rail cars may be down, but it's not telling us that intermodal is down at all. So it's really a good forward looking indicator. So thank you for raising that one. Um, uh, Andy, it's one of my favorites. So we could be stranded on Gilligan's Island together as long as we had our real time indicators report on the boat. So if you want to advance from there, the next slide in terms of um, really something that a lot of you are probably involved with is opportunity zones um, and how this plays into the you know adaptive reuse as well. Um, and so if you can advance there to the uh, next slide, maybe there we go. Or you know, go back one to the opportunity zones. I'm sorry, I was looking at the deck. So opportunity zones. As you know, we've got about 8,700 of them, but believe it or not, probably only about 10% are gonna be viable. So in, in the paper, and if you don't have it, we found a, believe it or not, an opportunity zone REIT that has collected all the data on all 8,700 uh, opportunity zones, the population, infrastructure, demographic information, and kind of given their interpretation of what are the winners and, and losers and, and why, but the estimates are we could have as much as $6 trillion in, in equity flow into these opportunity zones. Uh, and a lot of the, the capital, if you sell a, an asset today and you have a capital gain, could be a stock, a property, you name it, 
you can invest in a business or a real piece of real estate or vacant shopping center or department store. And uh, as long as you hold that for seven, for seven years, your, uh, your capital gains that you would have owed on that investment today are deferred for seven years, and then 20% can be forgiven. So those of us do cash flows understand fairly clearly the present value impact of, of, a, of a liability or a, you know, anything deferred seven years and then 20% forgiven. But if that's not enough, then if you hold the investment for 10 years, you're, um, you get to reset your basis on the entire investment. So this is gonna be probably one of the biggest, most exciting things. I know in my 35 year career, I thought you know, during, during the Reagan administration up until they reversed it out in 86, the, the tax um, stuff that he implemented was pretty stellar for real estate. But this is gonna blow the socks off. And many of the assets, that are gonna be available for, for reinvestment are gonna be um, adaptive reuse assets. And that's partly why we developed the adaptive reuse paper last summer this time is to lay the foundation. We will be updating that report, hopefully to have it published in time for uh, the San Diego meetings. Um, so as you remember last year, we wanted to define it, quantify it, show that it's real, it is a separate property type, and set the stage that these assets are primarily gonna be an opportunity zone. So they kind of go hand in hand. So I'll open up to you, Mark and Andy, about um, your thoughts on either opportunity zones or adaptive reuse, what you like, dislike, warning signs, opportunities you like. Um, so I'll open it up to, to each of you. So um, as far, I think you've summarized it real well, Casey. I think the creation of these opportunity zones is and the related tax incentives that they're offering uh, will have a significant market impact, especially for adaptive reuse. However, I think it's important to remember that, you know, one measure of feasibility is financial feasibility, but the properties have to make sense. There needs to be market demand. There needs to be, uh, you know, the site and location need to work. Uh, the political and legal aspects need to be feasible as well. And so just like the 1986 Tax Reform Act that you mentioned, you know, properties were built for tax benefit and, and failed to keep in mind the feasibility uh, test for other components. So I would at least add that as CCIMs, we need to be aware of the, the full uh, market impact and not just focused on uh, the financial impact that these operating zones and tax uh, relief is creating. Andy, I don't know if you want to add on onto that as well. I think that a lot of what I'm hearing is, uh, you know, we get a lot of inbound calls and asking about the um, opportunity zones in, in our market and what's available there. It reminds me a little bit of, of some of the calls that we get when people want a 1031 exchange and they're so focused on avoiding paying the tax that they disregard the quality of the investment and um, to your point, Mark, the idea of um, doing something simply because it's in an opportunity zone or the point of 1031 exchanging into a property that really isn't a property that you would otherwise invest in, you know, is, is a bad decision. It's a bad financial decision. There's, there's no point in 1031 and just for the sake of avoiding tax if you're going to end up losing your shirt at the end of the day on the new investment. Same thing with an opportunity zone is, you know, there's no point in seeking out an opportunity zone if there is a, uh, a property in an opportunity zone, if there is a better property that is not in an opportunity zone. Granted, that, that does depend a bit on the, the capital gains that you're trying to shelter uh, or defer. And um, there's implications to that, but it's an opportunity zone investment for the sake of the opportunity zone is is not the way we should be looking at these um, investments. Uh, the one thing I think is really exciting though about them is um, the opportunity zones give us the, uh, the ability to shake loose capital gains out of um, markets that didn't have an option. So I still think in a lot of cases, if people are coming out of real property, a 1031 exchange is probably their better option. But if you're selling a business or you're selling or uh, something along that line where historically you've had no choice but to pay the capital gains, this is really exciting for the commercial real estate industry because now suddenly we have a way, uh, an investment that somebody can make 
that um, gives them at least some tax benefit uh, in the near term and potentially long term if they uh, hold it for more than 10 years. So um, that part of it, I think, is really fascinating, but it still has to be a good investment. The opportunity zone is the cherry on top. Yeah, and as I think Mark and, and uh, Andy, you make really two key points here. So when we're looking at an opportunity zones and advising clients and adaptive reuse, we always should start back with the fundamentals of, you know, does it make sense? Is Does it stand on its merits in the market conditions? We shouldn't be starting with the tax be benefit and then trying to back into it. Is the deal feasible? We should be starting with, does the deal have market merits and feasibility? And the tax incentives really should be the icing on the cake. And I think the other point that you made, Mark, is, you know, the opportunity zones, this, these are long-term horizon deals. You've got to initially be in the deal seven years to defer the uh, capital gains. And one of the questions I think that's still unresolved is if you leverage it and put an amortizing bank loan on it, construction loan or whatever, does that portion of amortization disqualify it as return of capital? Or I think we're still waiting for Treasury and them to clarify that. So you got, you got to think about this. This isn't flipping the deal you know, in a couple or three years. This is you're in at least seven years. And then if you want the full benefit, you're in 10 years. So this is going to have to be more patient capital. And you've got to put a lot of capital into the investment. You can't just buy the asset and wait for it to appreciate. There's requirements that you you do that. So those are my two big takeaways is start with the fundamentals. Of does it make sense? Stand on its merits, have a decent yield. And then the tax benefits are icing on the cake that maybe take you from a 15 IRR to a over 20 and then think of these as long-term horizon, not short-term. Um, you guys, we're, we're right at the end. Do you want to add anything to that? But I think those are two really important points that you both brought to the forefront. So I guess we, we made it without going over, which is amazing when I'm involved. Because um, I, I, I usually uh, you say I'm a three-part economist and one, one of the three parts is Dave, I'm one part David Allen Cole. I'll stay around as, just as long as you let me. So I guess we'll throw it back uh, to CCIM, to uh, Jennifer and, and Larry to see if we have any questions. I know there's one in the queue from a kind of, you know, kind of well-known CCIM that kind of ties into this, but I don't know how you want to handle the questions. But we'll throw it back to you guys. Thanks, Casey. Yep, we have a few questions over here that we're gonna throw back to you. Um, Casey indicated that Dave Wilson, um, past president, has thrown out a question. First, he thanked um, you and Mark and Andy for leading this conversation. He really enjoyed it. Um, and then Casey, he narrowed this down to you, and it's a question about zoning. And you know, we've all heard the joke about Houston. It doesn't really have any zoning, and you see retail next to industrial, next to residential. Dave feels that we're, we're starting to see this take off nationally, where you see an Amazon or FedEx placing themselves in an old Sears box or mall. Um, and that this is transforming zoning classifications in towns so that they can fit these distribution facilities into their communities for job growth and filling those vacant boxes. Um, adaptive reuse at its finest. And Dave posits, if you think cities are going to continue to change their thought processes as it relates to change changing zoning classifications to allow for these types of uses in towns where they don't have them and or the land to locate them. And a great, great question. I guess that's why he was president of the CCIM. Uh, you know, you get, you get to the top by uh, being a good thinker. So I think, you know, when we wrote the adaptive reuse paper, one of the big challenges we, we identified that we heard over and over from every major developer was, you know, you're going into an unknown territory. You're taking, you know, say retail and you want to convert it to warehouse or you're, you know, you're encroaching warehouse uses even into residential and commercial areas. And in addition to the zoning, you've got real opposition from the tax assessing authorities. They think by converting the use that you're gonna make the property less valuable. And, and so they participate in kind of the battle. So we highlighted Tucson, Arizona is a market that was very progressive and had really oh. written up a complete overhaul of their, um, of their stuff. And uh, so I think it is going to be a challenge. It's one of the biggest challenges I think that we're going to continue to hear. Those cities that identify and understand, if they get, that these assets will stay vacant. That, you know, for example, a department store is not coming back to the empty department store. Toys R Us is not coming back to life. You've got to have another use and you've got to be able to uh, allow for it. If you're not flexible from either parking ratios, density, life safety, building codes, you know, setbacks, all of that type stuff, that asset's going to sit empty. 
And so it's why we called it Turning Blight Bright. It's our only opportunity. Unfortunately, Dave, I wish I could say it's gonna get better. I think it's gonna, it's gonna be a long slog, but it is our biggest opportunity. Um, at Monmouth Reed I was in, they participated in converting outside Dallas, a mall, an eight, 900,000 square foot mall uh, in Mesquite, uh, Texas, um, into a complete FedEx fulfillment center. And everybody was worried you'd have more truck traffic and noise, it would destroy the neighborhood and the property wouldn't be very valuable. And what they found is just the opposite. There's no more truck traffic than what was going in and out of the mall. There's actually less overall traffic. And the asset today is on the tax rolls at a higher number than at any point in its prior 10 years of, of life. So I don't think it's gonna get easier. I think it's up to us to be fully engaged in our community, to help us help communities understand it. That's why we wrote the Adaptive Reviews paper and showed pictures of its scalability. A lot of times the zoning and government, local government folks are afraid to make a decision that would be you know, be looked at as, well, that's, that's pretty risky. You're out there, you're converting what to what? Um, and especially when it comes to a housing, we need to do workforce affordable housing. So, you know, how do you convert, you know, a motel maybe to affordable housing or a warehouse into housing or, or put a hotel and apartments and retail all together in what used to be a department store building? It creates a lot of anxiety. So I think it's the biggest long-term challenge we face, Dave. And um, maybe we just need more Houston. Just let's let it all happen. I mean, Houston came out pretty well. I don't know if you want anything, Mark or Andy, about, about that thought. I think you covered it very well. Okay. Casey, we've got um, a few more here. One is um, for some, some specific data that others might be asking. So I'm going to throw that out there for you. But um, someone is wondering if there is a, a place where he can go to get specific information on options opportunity zones and I believe the question is is there a, a list of these I think you said 8700 opportunity zones throughout the country yeah so you can go to our, our uh, real estate center website at the University of Alabama or a number of others like at Texas A&M or University of Florida NYU a great place is your is your universities that have uh, well-developed real estate centers we have all of them for the country all of them within our state they're all mapped uh, and then I can send for us to post, it's a long link, it's to an Opportunity Zone REIT that has aggregated all of the basic information from population, demographics, infrastructure, um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, then they rank order each of the, um, uh, each of the 8700 MSA. So we'll give you that link after the call to post. But another great resource is to start with your, your universities. And the CCIM Institute is, is doing a lot in, in NARAD. I don't know if um, Mark or Andy, you're, you're doing anything in your, in your classes or that you're more specifically aware of? Well, um, one uh, place I've found them uh, listed in the geographies where you can find them is on Site to Do Business. If you go to Site to Do Business and you go to the Add Data link, which ties to Esri, a lot of these have already been loaded on Esri, so you don't have to recreate them. Uh, so that's one good shortcut that uh, you can check out. And I did find that website real quick. It's, um, you know, the three W's dot develop advisors, all one word, uh, advisors, ORS dot com forward slash opportunity dash zones dash index. Um, and that's uh, one that ranks all of them, which is a good one. If you're at right site to do business, I'd overlook that one. That's a good one as well. But do check out your, you know, in your in your respective states. Your Florida, you got the University of Florida's got a good one. Texas A&M's got a good one for Texas. We've we've got one at the Alabama Center for Real Estate that covers it all. We do a lot with that. Um, NYU's got a good site that does a lot around that. So those are some other good resources. And we've also got that link in the. In the first, uh, included in the first quarter insights report, so you can download it there also. And Casey, I wanted to set you up for a last question. We're gonna advance the slide here on what um, some of your favorite data sources are for analysis right now and why. <laughs> so it's all, always changing. So, um, you know, like I said, we started with, the, you know, the LinkedIn workforce is one of my favorite ones. I, I, I so think that we need to, um, go beyond the BLS data, things like it's not telling you where the new retail jobs, healthcare, it's saying that we're booming in healthcare jobs, but the healthcare jobs are in major markets, they're not in the rural or secondary tertiary markets, we're actually closing hospitals and losing. So really, I, I think it's time just to mature to a better um, one there. 
calculated risk is a great cliff notes one where charts and every economic topic that's going on each quarter you can go in you get the chart you get the data um, it, it's a good overview running total as you go through each quarter um, that's a good one i mentioned the you know the nfib i think it's so important that we small, follow small business for those of you that are looking for tenants and opportunities um, at the at ohio state university they house the national center for middle market companies these are companies that have proven their concept they have between 10 million and a um, billion dollars in revenue and they're growing rapidly and they're looking for for places to expand and where to go um, the other one is on on traffic indexes we all use old traffic count maps to you know for site selection and uh, for retail the new traffic map is mo is mobile traffic and so whether it's Verizon Verizon's got some stuff they use for over the holidays AT&T um, more and more retailers are looking at what their mobile traffic score is. And so if you're in New York and you are a Starbucks customer and you have the Starbucks app, if you get within a block of a Starbucks in New York, you're getting a pop-up um, ad and, um, and commercial on that. And the other one is TREP. Uh, TREP does a lot. They started their foundation was really in securitization. Um, I used them to help us when I was at the New York Fed to restart securitization, but they're migrating into a lot of other areas. They're doing really neat pioneering research on uh, things like co-working and is there a threshold point where the office building is, is a detriment uh, to have uh, co-working and right now the paper is about 40 percent so those are a few of my favorite ones go read the the rest of the paper and uh, and we'll always have more we'll, have, we'll probably have 10 more new ones by the time we get to San Diego <laughs> thank you Casey and just like that we're out of time we're at the top of the hour and I want to thank you and Andy and Mark for your time talents and expertise and to our attendees, thank you very much. We hope to see you again soon for another CCIM um, webinar. And until then, thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Thank you all.